Hi everyone, this is Craig Zelzer with Luala Mayen, the you know for season 10, episode five of the Social Change Career Podcast. We're delighted that everyone has joined us today and Luala has made time out of his busy schedule building and doing amazing things to share his wisdom and expertise. We're gonna be talking about gaming for social impact and just a couple of logistical things for people who have not joined the podcast before. This is live streamed. In a week or two, it'll be converted to one of our 100 plus episodes of the Social Change for Your Podcast. So you can watch on LinkedIn, YouTube, or listen to it on our podcast. We always appreciate um, if people are open to reviewing the podcast on whatever your favorite platform is, whether it's Spotify, Apple, Google, Podcast Addict, it helps us grow our impact. Um, I'll, I'll ask you all questions for 15, 20 minutes, but we really want to bring in from the audience your questions, your experience, your comments. And while we're getting started, please in the chat box on LinkedIn, just put in where you're watching from and feel free to share any comments. So I think, and then we have tons of amazing podcasts coming up next week. We have Julia Rieg from the Horizons Project. Um, we have Carla Yi, I'm going blank on her last name, from World Economic Forum, I apologize for that. Manuela Guzman and I mean, just amazing people up until season 10, we'll take a break around mid June. So the wall is a serial innovator and he is a South Sudanese video game developer and founder of Junub Games and also the Lawal Mayan Foundation. Um, he had, his parents had a flea South Sudan to Northern Uganda. So he grew up in a refugee camp in Northern Uganda. And he really went on to build amazing technical skills as a coder, a peace builder, a developer, an innovator. Um, he has been working at the intersection of games for social change, I think for at least 15 years, but he'll let us know if that is correct. He's a visiting scholar at American University, so hopefully he'll talk about some of that. He was recognized at the Game Awards as the Global Gaming Citizen. That is a very cool award and title by Facebook Gaming and the Game Awards. And he's currently building a VR virtual reality experience that focuses on individuals' behaviors and decisions that before picking up the gun, the small choices you make, both positive and negative, can have really good positive consequences or negative consequences and helps players in the game experience how to avoid the path of war and violence and resolving conflict. So again, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, and I'm just going to check out where people are watching from. So welcome, Charles from Boulder. And again, throughout the chat, please, hi, Ana Maria Trio from Colombia. So please let us know where you're watching from. Feel free to share your comments or a few sentences about your background. So Lawal, it's wonderful to have you today. Thank you so much for making time. And your setup, I think, is the coolest setup we've had out of the 100 plus episodes. Um, yeah. So you're joining us from DC. Um, so I'd love yeah. to hear a little bit, little bit about how in the world did you get into gaming for change? And you know, how did you start building the skills? You know, like what were you a gamer and then all of a sudden you realize there's there's a gaming for change field. So how did you go from gaming to actually building your own games, both in the global north and global south? Yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for actually having me today. I was really excited when I got an email from you. I'm like, wow, you know, Craig, it's been a while since we <laughs> since we've been in touch. Because I remember when I when I came to the US, we had a couple of meetings actually, like uh, one of like my mentors through uh, Peace Tech Lab and just like understanding me, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's been amazing, you know, so being able to like get some mentorship from you, you know, over the years and uh, being able to help me right now, like to, to be where I am today. So first of all, thank you so much. And I, maybe I can wait, I can wait to meet in person sometime soon. So, um, that's a really very good question. Like, how did I get into like, you know, you know, uh, into gaming, you know, uh, you know, gaming was not something, you know, especially when I grew up in Uganda, it wasn't something that was big, uh, it wasn't an in industry that I, that I thought I would be part of it, you know, and one of the things that I always say is that, you know, uh, when I was in the refugee camp, I never thought actually video game are made by people. I thought like they just fall from heaven because like we we had no access to like you know internet. We had no access to like you know it's you know better education in time for us to like be able to like find and be able to do things about gaming. But you know, so anyway, how I got into it was you know growing up in a refugee camp. I remember like you know downloading tutorials you know from you know from uh, from online and being able to like. You know, downloading game that that were offline. So actually, my first video game I actually downloaded was uh, Grand Theft Auto. So when uh, when I when I download Grand Theft Auto on my computer, and then I 
I came back home and I was like, wow, this is incredible. Like I start like that was the first encounter for me, like to, to to start playing video game. And then I was like, wow, like really games are really very interesting. They're very they are very good way for entertainment. And then by that moment I I, I thought to myself, I was like, wow, like, you know, I love them for entertainment, but what can I do? Is there a way I can be able to like learn how to code, allow how to, allow how to like you know, make graphics for the game or being able to like, uh, to like, what is the best way to be able to like, you know, bring this game into life and be able to understand like, okay, I don't have the team. I don't have people that I can work with, but you know, what is the best way for me to be able to like, you know, make the game by myself. So exactly that's really uh, what really got me into game. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you so much. And again, welcome Benjamin from South Sudan, I'm Ma Ana Maria oh, from wow. Colombia, Charles from Boulder, Colorado. Please let us know as we're going throughout where you're watching from. So, Lual, when did you first become aware? Was it through your own experience that games, I mean, games are, I mean, I, we have an almost 12 year old. He loves FIFA. So mm -hmm. he's much better. He beats me all the time. He loves Fortnite, but he likes FIFA better, mm -hmm. which I'm happy about. You know, and, and he, play, he, he plays competitive soccer in real life. So, thankfully, yeah. he's more engaged in real life soccer, but he'll do video games. Mm -hmm. But when did you first yeah. realize from Grand Theft Auto that? You know, there is a world of where games can have a positive impact, both on individuals and communities. Be, be, obviously, yes. like yeah, you yeah. Know, beyond beyond just the playing as a form of entertainment. Yeah. So you know, like the you know when I start playing, you know, Grand Theft Auto myself. Uh, so there's there's a lot of things that I realized. First of all, it's my own experience. Uh, my family, you know, they are from South Sudan. They had to flee war from South Sudan to find a place of refuge in the refugee camp. And and when you look at, at my background and also look at where South Sudan come from, you know, there, there's a there is like a, a conflict of war that has been going on through many years. So when you look at like almost 73 percent of the population in South Sudan are under the age of you know 30, you know, they're young people. Some of them are born in war, some of them were raised up in war. So and and their way the, the, the way they approach you know conflicts is so different. And when I was playing Grand Theft Auto, like everything in the game was like maybe sometimes violent. You know, if you want to like, you know, you stop somewhere and then you like, you know, you rob somebody's uh, car and get into it and fight them and so on. So that moment to me, I felt like, wow, like, you know, if the, if the games can be, be able to do things like this, how do, we, how do people feel about them, right? And to me, I was like, okay, maybe if I make a game for peace and conflict resolution in a time, but because games are really very powerful tool in terms of like, you know, just not only changing behavior, but also like, you know, uh, decision making, right? Like when 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 you're playing a character in the game, you know, it become you it, it's associated with you as a player. Sometimes it can be part of you because of because of the decision that you made. Uh, for example, I I had this amazing game I was playing with one of my friends. And um, we're just having fun, you know, and then I end up killing his character. And you're like, the way you react, you're like, yeah, why did you kill me? I'm like, no, I just killed your character. Like, no, no, you just killed me right there. You know, you see that, that, that part of, um, that part of like his reaction can be able to contribute the way they behave. So that's why I was like, okay, how about we, and they're very great way of telling stories. How about we bring these stories into the game? So that we can gamify them and see like how people can be able to like interact, you know, just not only these characters, but the way they also think about things that are actually happening around the world. Yeah. So can you talk a little about how you founded Junoob Studios and was it founded in South Sudan, in Uganda, in DC? And you know, how did you go about actually building a team or what was your first game? I mean, and you know, where did the idea to come to build your own studio come from? Going in. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So when Did I you... started like building, yeah, yeah, yeah. When I started like building uh, my game back in Uganda, uh, that was a that, that was a moment whereby like, I was like, wow, like I really want to build this into business because sometimes like when you look at the game, the game industry is a really very big industry, like a really big industry in terms of like you know they're independent game designers, they are like AAA companies where like people like it's big companies, but there are people that are individuals that can can build their own game. And some of them can, some people can publish them on App Store, people can just play them, it depends on your audience. So when I was in Uganda, then came back to the US, that, that was the time we met. And then that's like, I went into an accelerator program to be able to like, because my main focus was only, you know, like 
I only have a background in, 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 uh, in engineering, you know, programming, but I didn't have background in like how do you build a business. So, so when I came to the U.S., so that, that was a time when I, I was part of an accelerator program to be able to understand like how do I grow this into a business? How do I grow this into a team? And that's how I founded it, yeah. The accelerator program was Peace Tech Lab, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I put that in a little bit. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, what Peace Tech Lab does and both your cohorts? So mm -hmm. how did you go from having solid engineering experience to building a business that could, I mean, one is if a business survives, that's a huge accomplishment. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone's obsessed mm -hmm. with growth and metrics, but no, just, to survive, mm -hmm. just surviving is one thing. And then how did, you know, what did you get out of the accelerator? Obviously you got lots of peer content. Mm -hmm. Text, lots of mentoring, but how did that help you build a more stable and successful business? Yeah, I would say really like uh, the Pistex uh, Accelerator was really, really very important for me because I, I remember when they started Pistex uh, uh, Accelerator. So the Pistex Accelerator was an accelerator program that bring uh, companies you know around the world that are focusing on how how they're using the uh, tech background to be able to like resolve conflict. So we have companies that are like, you know, gaming, for example, my company was a gaming company that was actually making a game for peace and conflict resolution. So it's, 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 it's a tech, you know, idea, but you know, it's also like giving back to the community in terms of like, uh, in terms of like the product. So, so the Peace Tech Accelerator was really able to like help me a lot in terms of like, not only like connecting me with, you know, business, people that are actually having business mindset, but also it was also helping me to, as somebody that has a background in terms of in, in technology or like programming, I need to also understand like the peace tech world, right? Or the, the, you know, the, you know, the peace community to understand that, okay, how do people like, you know, react and solve conflict? I was able to like understand those things during the, uh, during, during the program and the accelerator program. And, and that kind of like helped me to chip my business in terms of like, wow, you know, you can actually like have a product in terms of like humanity and helping people, but it's still, it's a business, right? It's, it's not about what you do as a person, it's about like how, how does that product also like contribute to the society? So, and, and as somebody that was also just only like, you know, as like, I'm a programmer, I want to understand the theory of peace. I want to understand of like, how countries and nations solve, you know, conflict. So those alone were able to help me to like be able to like understand what my product is and what I can be, be able to do with it so that it can help people much better. And then just, just of course, I was like, you know, like I, I, I was able to do a lot of like, you know, you know, how to organize my, you know, my pitch, uh, my date, everything like just like in, you know, setting up a business, setting up a, there's a lot of like your team as well. So it was a very good um, program that kind of like showed me a lot to be able to, you know, not just survive today, but I also understand like, how do I keep on building my um, my product and so on, yeah, yeah. Um, so again, where people are watching on LinkedIn, feel free to add where you're watching from, your questions, your comments. Um, so if you had to describe since you started Junoob Games, what would you say is either the metrics in terms, like how do you measure success? So is it downloads? Are you doing any research to find out people who use the games? Like what type of change it has? Is it working with, you know, is it employing developers? Like, like what are the metrics of success that you would cite so far and where do you hope to go in the next? Yeah, I mean, years? like, you know, yeah, as, as an entrepreneur, there's so many ways we kind of like try to, you know, uh, measure the metric, especially like, for example, that people like, for example, as, as my game is coming up and being able to devolve it, for example, I can see like, you know, testing the game. For example, right now we we actually have a, our game installed in a museum in, um, in in Germany, and 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 people go to the museum for free and watch the, and play the game, you know, and and then we're able to like get you know the feedback because that well we're able to do that because we want to see what is the best way we can be able to release the game slowly by slowly. And uh, I'm just, I'm really excited. I'm going to announce soon. We are also like in, uh, introducing me to another uh, museum in, uh, in in French. 
And and the, the the reason is because I'm like wow, like you know, this is this is not something I ever thought. And the reason is because I want people to also experience the game in the museum whenever they go in there. So I'm able to see that data uh, to be able to see, like, okay, wow, like should I keep on building it or like what do I need more to, uh, to have more you know more people like testing playing the game and 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 also their interest, you know, for example, like student can try to play the game and so on. So there's so many. Uh, ways like as entrepreneur, like uh, how we measure metric in terms of like you know building a product. It might be like you know in the first you know uh, in, in in the first stage. It can be like in the in the last stage. It can be in the goal stage. But you know like the metric that you try to to see is the only metric that can help you to keep pushing and keep building that product. If, after that, it can go far. You know. So yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, can you talk a little bit about you know the both Junu Games and your foundation in terms of is it you? Do you have you know permanent or part time developers or marketing or salespeople? You know, in, ter in terms of both the studio and the foundation, a little bit about the focus of the work, the size of the team, um, and kind of some yeah, other. Yeah, so input. yeah, so yeah, so with uh, with my studio or Junu Game itself, like um, I have like. Uh, folks that I'm working with, like developers, animators, and and so on. Some of them like a part time. So uh, just because we're just focusing on on the game and building that product. Uh, for my foundation, I have a team as well. So um, my foundation will focus a lot on like teaching kids on game design and animation. So we're able, and I can say that uh, we're able to like really raise some funding from like um, Unity Technologies to, to be able to like you know. Have a card that was that has been amazing. Like we have been an amazing, been two years right now working with Unity Technologies with my foundation, and then we got an amazing support from uh, Olgin PC. So Olgin PC was able to donate like really like <laughs> the computers that I'm using right now, like very powerful computers to the kids in the refugee camp. So like our focus is just to see what, for example, when I was growing up in a refugee camp, I did not have access to like you know. You know, in enough resources, right? And 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 I think that right now, when I I do, I do have connection. I do have people that really want to help and be able to donate. So and then there are big companies right there that are like, you know, they want to give back to the community. You know, like they want to give back. Education is really very important in so many ways. So that's why, like, you know, companies like Unity Technologies, you know, like you know, Origin PC, and and, and different companies that are also joining forces and believing that you know, you know, talent is something that is. <laughs> That it's 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 everywhere, but opportunity is not. So yeah, it's it's and, and I think that's like that's why we're focusing on foundation to we'll keep growing it. We'll allow to partner with different people. Uh, uh, maybe sometime soon we'll open another another you know project in the U.S. So it depends. So I think for me it's just like it's not more than just technology. It's about like how do we how do we give uh, resources to uh, to this. Uh, communities that do not have access to them, yeah. So, you know, I was talking to someone this morning who's done a lot of work in tech in East Africa, so not so, not so much. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things we were talking about is just power dynamics and representation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so like in the US, the number of black engineers in the gaming industry is tiny. It was mm -hmm. starting to grow. Mm -hmm. So, um, and obviously, I live in Colombia. My wife's nephew not now he works for a big company, but he was a you know a game designer, and mm. trying to build for the Latin American market. But if you just mm. think, for the African market, you know, are there big game studios like EA or those things? Like, are there are there homegrown? Whether it's Ugan, you know, East African, Southern African, North Africa, MENA region, like, are there big game studios in Africa producing for the African market, or is it still mostly? coming from the global north, the big game companies that are selling to the African market? Yeah, that's that's really like, that's that's really a very good question, actually. So like, I always say that, um, what can I say? Like, you know, I, I, I would say that Africa is the future of gaming, right? In terms of like, you know, the population, the young people, the people that are interested, I think it's just more of like, we have talent already, like that is building. I've seen a lot of, um, uh, game studios really in Kenya, in Nairobi, in like uh, in South Africa. Uh, I, I was in South Africa for about um, before I came here. So I was doing an internship with a company in South Africa it's called Celsa Game, and 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 the reason was because like I was able to understand like what the market looked like in, in Africa. I think it's just more like 
right now I can see more investment going into African game studios. Uh, a lot I can see like, you know, uh, friends of mine in Cameroon making incredible like, you know, games and shipping them out. So I think there is there is a little bit of change. I would say in terms of like, you know, big companies like, you know, like of course EA and, and so on. No, we don't have yet. But in the future, I think that we will have companies like that because I I see more investment going into the in, uh, into the industry and uh, and the game industry in Africa is like really really growing. Uh, so one of my friends is a head of um, uh, of um, is a head right now of uh, of YouTube gaming and he's actually like one of my best friends. So he helped me a lot. Actually, his name is Leo Olebe. Yeah, one of my mentors and. Every time, so he was still at Facebook Gaming when we when we became friends and we became like mentors, and then he moved to to Google. And right now, he's the head of uh, of 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 of, of uh, YouTube Gaming. And I think people like that being able to be in that uh, leadership, you know, position, kind of like give us as well as as our, as as African game designers and developers and then companies to be able to see, oh wow, like. There is someone right there, like being a, right there, we can look up to, you know, he's actually both from Uganda and Kenya. So I think uh, looking at, at, at that powerhouse, it's, it's something that we need more as, you know, as, as, as people of color as well. But there's so much, it's, uh, the, the industry, is, it, it can do better, but it's, it's, it's getting there, you know, like people are really doing well, yeah. yeah. So, so if you had to say, whether it's from like one part of Africa, a region or a country, like has you know what has been to date you'd say the biggest blockbuster game that's been developed for either in Africa or for the African market like is there anything obviously not Fortnite level but is there anything that has gotten good sales traction or you know multiplayer like you know whether it's a, a role player game or single player or like is there is there any place you could say there's been a couple of really big successes that show the potential or is it still kind of they're being built and they haven't fully gone to market yet yeah, there's actually a really good game that are that are shipping right now. So uh, I may not mention them, but like there is like if you go on Steam, and I think there's a lot of like really, uh, really very good you know game out there. You know, I would say the best way to say it is like you know, uh, people can sign on our African Gaming, and then they can be able to like go on the website and see like all oh, like there's a website there where you can see all oh, like companies in Africa that are focused on game design and like what kind of game they uh, they, they, they are working on. But I, I, to be honest, yeah, there's, there, there's some really good games that are outside, yeah. Okay. Um, and then going back to peace and social change, I put in a couple of resources, like Gaming mm -hmm. for Change is a great resource, yeah. mm -hmm. National mm -hmm. Games. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you see the connection? Because a, a lot of games, I mean, I would say sport gaming is not too violent, but most of the, I mean, and The Sims is not violent, but a lot of mm -hmm. the really most popular games, and most people don't realize gaming is a much bigger industry than Hollywood. I forgot mm -hmm. the metrics, but it brings in mm -hmm. much more money per year mm -hmm. than, you know, Hollywood. So are, have you seen many commercially successful games for change or impact, or most of the games that are for more social change have to be funded by foundation. Like they found a hard time getting a commercial model. That was actually that was actually really one of the things that I struggle with, and that's what a lot of people ask me. Like, hey, you want to do like, for example, like people time them as uh, as uh, how do you call it, serious game, right? For example. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. So a lot of people sometimes think that wow, like you know, you know, social social games and games that are like. Games are really like there's a game there, like uh, that they're there to tell stories. For example, you know, it might not just be a game that 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 only for peace and conflict resolution, but it can be a game that is telling stories. That is game for social change. For example, like uh, there's a game called um, you know Last of Us, right? People may think it's really mm -hmm. like just because it's too big doesn't mean that it's a, it's, it's a game that is telling a story of things that are happening around the world. So. So, so I think that you know that there is a, a lot of game there, and there is there is, uh, and that's why like, you know, being in touch with, uh, being in touch with like Game for Change has been an amazing, uh, an amazing, um, uh, let me say like uh, help for me because it kind of like bring this community of people that really focus on, 
on, on, on making game for social impact. You know, there are games, you can use game for anything, you know, there are game in the hospital healthcare, you know, there are game for like everything you can. So I think that uh, there has been a really big, like, right, which is going very well right now. It's, it's like, you know, the serious game industry or like, you know, the social impact game industry is really doing well and and, and, and it's getting the recognition that it's, um, it is out. For example, I was, uh, as you mentioned before, like in the industry before, people did, did not even focus on it alone. And then when I started making my game, uh, that's when I won the, you know, the Global Gaming Citizen. It was something that didn't, wasn't existing before. People are beginning to understand, wow, like games are really very powerful. Like games, we need to like highlight this more in the industry. And, and, and also like being able to like, you know, and understand this game that, that are really very powerful. Like I remember like having a conversation with, you know, the former president of Nintendo and we're just like thinking about like, okay, what what are these big companies like Nintendo doing, you know? And and in terms of like, of course, like even, you know, even like their games are also they're telling stories. And that's why like, I always say that, you know, the video game industry is an industry of people who love what they want to play. So they choose, they choose what they want. They are a fan of something that they love. They are a fan of things that that they want to relate to. And I think that's why the industry is it's it's growing every single other time. So yeah. Okay. Um, so we still have time. Welcome, Fernando. Welcome somebody from University of Washington. So feel free to put in your questions and comments or anytime. We'll try to bring them in. Um, so a question, let's say someone is watching this live or they listen to the podcast whenever and they're like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Like I love video games, but they don't know how to code. And what is your recommendation for someone who wants to start wor exploring work at this intersection of games and impact? Should they run out and jo join a coding boot camp? Should mm -hmm. they learn, should they do self-taught stuff? Should they learn how to market? Should they learn VR? Like, what, what, like obviously there's no one path, but for people, who are yeah, curious yeah. and maybe they're great gamers, but they don't have the technical skills. Where do you recommend someone starts to explore how to build a career in this industry? Yeah, so that's that's really a good question. Like how to you know start you know being a you know video game uh, designer as uh, or developer or anything nowadays have changed. It's not like how it's not like a traditional way of learning anymore. Like you know when you have to go to the university. Like doing, for example, to me when to when I started learning programming, you know. Uh, First thing, what I had to do was to, you know, go on YouTube and get some tutorial how to make a video, how to how to code, how to like, like there's a lot of them. But even even though there's actually a lot of like gaming engine, for example, I can say like Unity itself as its own, um, you know, you know, it, it's it's a game engine where people you know make games, you can create your game, and there's a lot of resources. I'm actually one of uh, Unity creators. So there is a lot, yeah. You know, when you go Unity learning and so on, there's a lot of like there's a pathway to programming. There is you know how to you know beginners and so on. There's all like tutorials on how like, how to even start designing game on 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 the engine itself. Um, so there's a lot of resources there that can help you guide you. If you want to become a developer, that's fine. If you want to become an animator, that's fine. So there's a lot of like, and and that's what I that's what we're doing with especially with uh with my foundation is that we instead of like developing curriculum, instead of like you know getting all those you know we started from the scratch, we leverage all these Unity resources to be able to like okay this is already existing, you know like how can we do that you know. There are actually other ways of like, you know, maybe Coursera. You can just go on Coursera and sign up on a on on um on a course that can help you to, to go there. As you say, like the game industry and and, 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 and and careers that are in there, there's so many. You know, somebody can be like maybe um, a level designer. You don't have to be you know, be a programmer. Some 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 somebody can only be like you know, a writer, you can only write a whole game, <laughs> like it's a whole process, like you can be a game director. So like, how do you direct uh, the game itself? So it's a really big sound designer. So there's, there's so many things that you can be able to do to be part of the industry and then how you can be able to like, pub your way into like, into, into, into the industry. Uh, you know. 
So you mentioned earlier the quote, which I love that, you know, talent is universally distributed opportunity. Unfortunately, today still isn't. Mm -hmm. And where, where we live in Medellin, um, there's, you know, it's close to U.S. Eastern time zone. Happy we're the same time zone. The, there's a lot of effort to make this a, they call it, um, there's a center for the fourth industrial revolution connected mm -hmm. to the world, you know, economic forum. And there's a lot of effort to make this like a software valley. And then we have a lot, we have a lot of call centers here. I mean, tons of call centers. Um, and I even have friends who work, you know, on the, those. Mm -hmm. But the idea is to build higher quality local tech talent, both for the Colombian market, Latin America, and also for the, mm -hmm. the global market. And it's there's there's actually companies that are connecting Latin American talent to mm -hmm. North American companies because let's say, you know, if a good developer and well, California is very expensive, let's say, you know, it could be 10 or $15,000 a month for a really good developer or more. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and here, you know, like a company could hire someone for four or $5,000 mm -hmm. a month or 6,000. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, and there's obviously all sorts of cha challenges with that, but are there things going on on that? You would say in the East African market where particularly I'd say Kenya has got some really, I mean, Kenya, Nigeria, and West Africa, there's really strong mm -hmm. talent. So is there also some effort? I mean, obviously, locally built companies is, you know, would be ideal, but there's also such global demand for all kinds of talent and engineering and video design. And so is there, do you know of companies that are kind of bringing together the top talent from Africa to global companies? Yeah, I mean, it has always been, um, it has always been a big topic of discussion, especially, you know, when you look at like talent itself and then and, and different part of uh, different countries, for example. And um, I think Africa in terms of like uh, tech is really doing very well. So I see, uh, I've been having conversation with a lot of like, uh, I see a lot of company that have been really like thinking about, okay, what is the best way can we be able to like, it's like, it's a hub of like talent itself. And, and, and I was just having a conversation with one of my friend a couple, like about a month ago, and he, he, his company is based in Miami and his focus is to bring, you know, in the next, you know, in the next couple of years, maybe five years, 10 years, he want to like make sure like you're over like maybe 10,000 or like 30,000 like designers only from Africa, right? I, I think we're seeing uh, entrepreneurs right now that are focusing a lot on how do we bring these careers to, to, to the people. For example, like I remember, um, I remember like during the pandemic, you know, somebody is like, you know, somebody can be anywhere. And, uh, and, and the biggest issue those days was like, okay, you can have talent in Africa, but you might need to come to the US, right, to, to, to work here. Uh, and then in that in, in itself, there's a lot of process, maybe the visa issues, like the, all those things. So those are like, those were some of the things that because there's talent as well, it was, it was so hard for people to be hired in Africa. But now, for example, like Adele, like you, you, just, you just mentioned, like I, I, was doing, um, I was doing a project with, uh, with, uh, with Mata, like Facebook uh, about a year ago, and, and most of the engineers, you know, came through that. Right, so I think those those um, yeah, there's, a, there's there's a lot of like, you know, talent hub right now that are really doing an amazing work. So you can be in Africa, you can be anywhere, but you can work from wherever you are, which is actually something we have seen from like the whole idea of like working from home. So it has actually like reduced a lot of you know issues that people used to face, people that had talent, right? So I remember like when I was back in Uganda before I came to America, I I wanted to not even just come and work in America, but I was I was invited to uh, to GDC. GDC is like one of the biggest like game um, uh, game gathering in the world, bring over thirty thousand people. And I was really excited. I'm like, wow, like I'm going to give a talk at like, GDC. And you know, the next thing happened was like Trump got to get trouble. Then I'm like, wow, like what's going on? I couldn't <laughs> I couldn't make it. So that that alone, you know, that that alone, those those two most more things that always affect people that are talented. But I think right now this this um, that is something people are focusing a lot. It's like how do we reduce those, you know, those issues or like and find solution to them. But yeah, there's a lot of companies there that are really that are becoming a half of like, you know, bridging the gap between the you know the company that are hiring and the talent itself. And 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 and, and it's it's been good, you know. And and that's one thing that I 
uh, I'm trying to do like company that I know, maybe like you know Unity Technologies, maybe Epix Game, or maybe you know like different companies that I know that uh, where can we you know bridge the gap between you know the talent and 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 um, and, 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 the, and and the working world. Yeah. Okay. Um, so welcome, Becky. Thanks, Thea. Um, if people want to ask questions, we still have a little bit of time left. So we have lots of people watching, um, but we'd love to also hear from you with your questions. So can you talk a little bit more about the VR game you're building? And you know, is it launched? I mean, talk about the games in the museum. Is that the same as the, the current game you're building, or that's a different one? And you know, with the VR game, um, I mean, it'd be really interesting for people just to know how in the world do you go from an idea of a game to actually scoping and building it? Like, how long does that whole process take? Yeah, it's a, it's a lot. So sometimes, like, when you look, first of all, like, building a game is like, you know, making a movie itself. Like, you know, so, like, the difference is, of course, with making a movie, it's like, most of the movies right now actually require programming, you know, require programmers, you know. I, for example, like, um, um, most of the, there is a new movie called Avatar. And uh, like uh, the way of the water, then it's a new one. And it took uh, James Cameron about like 15 years to make a second one. And the reason why I mentioned that as an example is that the reason why it took him to like three years, I mean, 15 years, 10 years to be able to like make a second movie of Avatar is he was looking for the right technology. He was looking for the right technology to be able to, you know, to, to build that. And 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 uh, and most of most of the characters and, and and design were actually made by uh, by using Unity. So and and which is a game which is a game engine. So I, th I think that you know like of course it's good to have an idea. It's good to be able to like you know write the story. How you want the game to run? Uh, what are you you know? Who is your target market? Who do you want to like? As I mentioned before, the game industry is an industry of people who love what they want to play. So you have to exactly figure out what is this game made for. And then after that is like putting the talent together. What do you want for you to be able to like break this game together? You need an artist, you know, to be able to draw characters. You need um, maybe sound designers. You need like um, programmers. You need like, you know, those as, as, as an entrepreneur or someone who is actually like beginning the, doing the game by yourself it can be very tedious. It's a very, it's a very long way to be able to like, have an idea. for example, like when I started uh, working on Salam, right? Like the, the first version is not the same or second. Like, so every single day, like you sleep, you think about it and say, oh, there's something that I really want to, you know, add, you know, every single day, like you, you think about something. So it, it's really it depends on, on your, on your resources and, and, and the power. So yeah, game that can take three years, game that can take up to five years, game that can take only one year building it because you have enough resources to be able to build and bring a team together. So it's like a regular way of like bringing product to, to life, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Becky, for the mention of Victoria. You know, again, so we put in lots of resources in the chat. Rational mm -hmm. Games is doing great work. They give small mm -hmm. grants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. to both, both you know human games like people interacting mm -hmm. together and also computer games so check them out my friend mark young he was on our podcast you can see him probably first or second season oh um, well yeah you know. actually yeah, I, I love the whole rational game is doing i remember i think you you connected me with mark young before yes yeah so yeah the, the work is really incredible in terms of i think that i think that the the biggest issue a lot of like uh um, designers or like you know game developers which face a lot especially individual it's like small grunt you know like sometimes it's so hard for you to start something without you yeah. kind of like pay your your bill and stuff like that so and also hiring a team so i think uh the work they're doing especially with conflict resolution game and so on it's it just it's, it's incredible i think that's yeah that's that's mm -hmm. I, I would like to give shout out to them as well yeah mm -hmm. yes yeah mark um can you talk a little bit about what are you doing at American University? So are you researching? Are you teaching? Are you helping to integrate, you know, tech into the curriculum? Like what, as a visiting scholar, like what, what type of things are you doing at the university? Yeah, so when I became uh, like a visiting scholar at American University, um, uh, shout out again to like, <laughs> it couldn't be possible without like at least a, uh, at least game for change. 
and then also um, one of my good friend, uh, Lindsey Grace. So he was actually the he was actually like uh, the head of gaming um, at American University, but right now he he is the head of um, is a, a faculty in uh, the University of Miami. Like one of the amazing people in the industry in terms of like focusing on game for change and like bringing you know uh, game to classes to universities. Really amazing with that. So. For me, mine has always been, so I, I use like, I would say that when I joined uh, American University as one of the best game design, you know, I think curriculum actually um, right now, in terms of like, for the focus a lot on um, on game for social change. So most of the universities uh, have game design, you know, of course, uh, courses, but uh, training. So, but mostly it's like, you know, they don't, they don't, focus on like what is a human part of games, like how can you use them for like social change and so on. So so for me, I'm like, okay, I, I interview with students, like build a game with them, give them feedback, research and so on. And, and that's what I do with them, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so one question, there was an article maybe in Wired, New York Times, somewhere, you know, there's a, there's a lot of mm -hmm. exploitation in the gaming industry. I'm talking about even in North America, not the globe, mm -hmm. but a lot of, a lot of people working for gaming companies have reported, you know, it's insane deadlines, crazy work hours. Yeah. And if they're, if they're permanent staff, that's one thing, but if they're contractors, it's like, you go, you know, go contracted contracts. There's a lot of like unhealthy work culture. Um, I'm not saying all, all developers mm -hmm. and all gaming mm -hmm. companies, but if someone is thinking about a career in tech and gaming or tech in general, you know, what about work-life balance? And then do you have any suggestions? I don't want you to name any companies, but do you have any suggestions if someone has a potential contract or offer, how do you vet to make sure they're just not going to chew you up? Like, you know, basically make you work 20 hours, mm -hmm. you know, 16 hours a day for three months, pay, maybe pay you well, but then just like goodbye. Like, how do you vet, you know, both the, whether it's a permanent job or contract, how do you do that to make sure it's not going to be a un somewhat unhealthy work environment? Yeah, that's a really very good question. Uh, I think that I remember um, a couple of years ago, like it was like a big hot topic in the game industry because it, it's like, again, work life is really, it's, it's, it, can, it, it can be very hard sometimes, especially like we talked about before, uh, but how long does it take for you to make a game, you know? And uh, and also like so it depends also with the with the company leadership. So in terms of like okay like how do they treat their you know employees and so on. So what I would say is like of, yeah I, I would I would be able to like you know connect with the right people you know seek advice and then and have um, you know just make sure that you have a, a you know you you read you read background about that company and like their work culture as well is always there the work ethic is always there. So, and of course, like the time whereby, you know, companies want to like, you know, release a game and they have a time, you know, like a deadline and then there's a time crumb and then you have to like, sometimes game might be leaked and that's the most worst, worst thing. So like when the game is leaked, it's like, how do you actually maintain that? Or do you want to like push it above or do you want to just release it immediately? And that also like contribute to that way of like, oh, we need to like, you know, spend hours of like developing the game and getting it done or if like, so there's a lot of things that contributed that I wouldn't say no, because it's it's, it's, it's a right article. There's, there's so much that sometimes goes on into the industry. And I try my best sometimes to be careful with that, especially because like, I, to me myself as when I first started like making game by myself and then and being like the only developer, I would work many hours sometimes i wouldn't sleep because that is me by myself and then which is not good because like you need you need you need you need a better space where you can be able to think and so on so yeah yeah there's there's a lot of resources you can be able to like find but it's not all the game industry uh, companies but they're yeah, actually really good companies out there yeah, yeah. <laughs> so i think i have three more questions but again if anybody has a question let us know so one is what is your forecast you know, as artificial learning and machine learning becomes much more sophisticated. You know, I've been playing around with chat GPT, mm -hmm. you know, and it, ha it definitely has challenges, but it's amazing what it can do as a base. You know, obviously I think mm -hmm. I, like I, 
I'm teaching a course and like I had it I had, for the course I had chat GPT come with a cover letter for a specific job based on my LinkedIn profile. Mm -hmm. You know, and some of the things that drew out were not true, but it was great, like for 75% base of a brilliant cover letter, and then it still mm -hmm. needed the human touch. But, you know, it's AI is already starting to write its own code. So just mm -hmm. where, you know, for people who are interested in being informed, also just like the opportunities and dangers, like, are you, how are you thinking about AI or any of the tools coming out, whether it's visual or text-based and, you know, is, is AI and machine learning going to become so good that we won't need, you know, we, we'll need programmers to keep it running, but it'll be so good that it'll just kind of be creating its own code. So you know, what are your thoughts about where yeah. both? I think I, to me, I feel like, yeah, that's, that's a really, I know a lot of people have been like really talking about that a lot. Uh, and to me, I'm really very, I'm very, uh, very optimistic about it. I, I feel like it's gonna, it's gonna change a lot of things, especially right now with uh, how I think. First of all, one thing I don't like about, as myself a lot, one thing I don't like about technology is and how with the generation we're in right now is most most of the things are about hype. But I think the uh, the but with uh, AI and you know. I think that's not about high business. It's a reality and it's something where we're heading to. Uh, so the only thing that I sometimes get concerned, I think like maybe like NFTs, you know, uh, I'm still okay with that. I'm, I'm still okay with like the crypto and so on. I'm, I have no any problem with that. Uh, I think that, uh, of course, like we're gonna have more coding, but it's gonna need a lot of still human resource, exactly. People who provide the code. I was just watching a movie um, recently, and it's called Megan. Uh, it's about uh, <laughs> yeah. So like when when I when I watched that, I was like, oh wow! Like honestly, it does not disqualify the idea. Like actually, artificial intelligence and 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 and, and that um, the technology doesn't require people. It does. It's like the only thing is how do we do that? What okay? What kind of data are we providing to? It? And I think that's why like if we don't have enough data. It's, it's going to be hard, but it will also just change the career in, in, a, in, in, a, in a very a slight way. So uh, to me, like, I'm, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm excited for the future. I'm excited and see what to, um, what to, what is coming up and, 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 and find the best way to adapt. So I'm, I'm not really worried. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> a couple of questions came in from Becky, um, behavioral change. So, you know, so is a question, if you want to clarify, Becky, you're asking, does gaming potentially create trauma or could it be like if someone had some difficult childhood out gaming could be something to help build resiliency so any thoughts on that well yeah i mean that's yeah that's a really very good question especially the two way can it cause and, and that is actually one one of the questions people used to ask me when i when i was creating um uh working on salam so salam is a game that um that you take a refugee from a war torn country to to uh, to find them a place of uh, refuge. And and someone was asking me like, okay, if you're creating a game about the real life experience, how are these people going to react to it? Because that's something they have been through, right? And, and I was like, wow, that's a very good way of like understanding that can it remind you or can it, uh, can it change your behaviors? One thing I know is that is you have to know the audience. You have to know what you are playing. And then, and I think that's why, like sometimes you kind of like uh, switch and find like what are the best way, the like, best games that you can be able to play for that particular reason. Uh, sometimes it can it can affect is like actually like watching a movie, right? Like uh, when you watch the wrong movie and remind you of how you were, and then you feel like oh wow this is. But if you, if you have um, if you are playing a game that trigger your mind and be able to like get you to aware of your thinking it's, it's really it, it does not it does not and it also can be able to to change your behavior in time of, in terms of like how do you feel about that certain uh, situation and and uh one example of the game i would say what's um for example like of course uh, like lots of us you know it's it's, uh, it's about like you know the you know the, uh, the thing that happened and how do we actually think about that so i think it's just like uh, what do you want to play? Of course, like, yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. So um, Magaga has a question. Thanks. Gaming addiction is it bad? If so, what are the potential intervention remedies? And I, I would ask two related questions. 
yeah. of, peop of people who play video games, you know, because there's stats like of people exactly. who drink yeah. or people who people gamble, X percentage can become addicted. So is, is there data, you know, I think South Korea is the most addicted country in the world for the video games, but is there data that shows, you know, if you have a thousand people playing video games, like 20 can become addicted or you know, like, what are your thoughts about that? Well, <laughs> that's a very, yeah, that's a very, that's a really very good question. I think uh, to, to me as a game designer and also a, a game, um, a game player, I think, um, yeah, it's always there. It's always there. And um, I think the best thing about gaming right now is it can definitely be and, and in, a, in, a, in a good way and also in a bad way. Uh, there are people, uh, that addiction depends on like, when you're playing the game, what are you getting out of it, right? There are people that are streamers, people like, oh my God, like every single day you play the game and you, you, you're earning from it. Uh, we have games that are like, even for example, like in the Philippines, um, we have games that are, for example, play to earn. And, and even for you just to like play games, it's, it's more than just the addiction, it's actually helping you uh, with, it, it, you know, it's, it, 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 it does help with economic boost. Uh, they, are, they, are, they are kids that are actually playing game, but they're able to pay their, um, you know, their, their school or their food or something like that uh, from like play to one game. So th there is always that aspect of like, okay, what is, a, why are you addicted to that? You know, like, why are you playing games every single time? Uh, so it, it just, it just, there's a lot of stuff and it can be like a really bad thing. It can also be a good thing, yeah, yeah. depending on really where you're going with that, yeah. Okay. Um, so, so my last two questions, I want to be respectful. So what is your favorite current game that you, like when you're not, when you just want to have fun and yeah. not think too much, like, yeah. you know, is it, is it a multi role player game, single player? Like what, what are one or two games that you just love that you might recommend others check out? Yeah, it depends. Like, so I'm a big, uh, I love PC game. Like that's it. Like I love to play game on PC. I, so my favorite game and I'm also playing games on, um, uh, on, on, on PlayStation. So my favorite game of all time that I love to play is called God of War. Uh, so that, that game is just like, again, that's, that's why I always say like, I, I love, uh, I love games that steal stories, you know, the, the God of War is a, is, is a story of father and the son. And then like that relationship, how it goes, it's just, it's just my favorite. I love it so much. Uh, my other game that I love to play is, uh, yes, Stranding. So uh, this training is, uh, it's a game like where like, it, I, I just love the, you know, the, the person that directed the game is one of the people that inspired me a lot. And I, I wish one day, <laughs> one day I can reach his level. So, and he's a very genius person in terms of like, he made a game in 2019 about, um, about how delivering packages can become a problem. And, <laughs> and, then, and, and then actually even after, after he released the game, in 2020, like when the pandemic became, and then there was like a, there was an election in the US, and then immediately there was actually a problem of delivering packages and people couldn't find them. I'm like, wow, like, this, are you appropriate? Like, what are, like, how do you, and that's how games are really very powerful. Someone can predict the future, you know, like, for example, we, as we talked about last of us before, you see what happened, and it was only a video game. So I think that, you know, people create things just for us to experience, but at some point, you know, we might actually, find them coming so yeah thank you those are my favorite okay and, and then my, my last question what is your favorite show about you know let's say tech or video game like we loved silicon valley like it just made mm -hmm. fun of everything like I just, I just think it's one of the most brilliant entertaining shows about the good and the absurdity of so much of silicon valley mm -hmm. you know there's a lot of good but just like the funding and the so do you, and there's one on Apple TV, I forgot the name, it's all about the gaming industry, but like, do you have any favorite shows or movies that kind of make fun of it all? Oh, uh, not at all. Like, yeah, sometimes I just, um, cause I don't, I don't have the time a lot. So I don't get to like watch a lot of things going on in the Silicon Valley, but I try to be in touch sometimes, but I watch other kind of other type of movies. But yeah, there's like a really good movies there. So, but I, I don't have any thing in okay. mind though. Yeah, I do. I just look at Apple TV. It's called Mythic Quest. It's quite entertaining. Yeah, I think I've, I've seen. Yeah, yeah, I think I've seen that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and, and then my final question, um, both in terms of the game you're working on, like, 
what in terms of the studio and the foundation like when how can people access your game when do you have a date for your next release and then how could people either help the studio or the foundation like what what type of assistance for both things are you looking for yeah so like especially like, yeah so right now like uh we have a lot of updates coming especially working on uh the bouncing in our website right now on my foundation you can go on the foundation site and then on the on uh on the on the new game you can go on on um, on, on the website as well so i think you know the biggest uh, the biggest thing is i if you're traveling, so our biggest focus right now is we're installing the games uh, in the museums. So when I will, I will send you the, the links later on. But if you you are part of a very big collection, so 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 if people are in, if you if someone is in Paris, uh, they can be able to like go to the museum. Um, and then also in Germany we have one. So we are also talking with different museums in the U.S. to install the game there. So the, yeah, there's so many ways we can yeah we can be able to like um, yeah be part of this yeah. <laughs> and what what what's the best channel to connect with you? LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Twitch. Like if people want to just yeah you know, like follow think, yeah, my, work. yeah my my favorite is actually right now is LinkedIn. <laughs> okay. This is one way. Yeah, so it's my it's my favorite way of connecting. I, I'm also on Twitter the same. Um, yeah. So yeah. Okay, so thank you so much for sharing your time and wisdom. And please check out the game studio and the wall and the foundation. Um, and this will be up in a podcast episode in a week or two. And you know, the, the work they're doing is brilliant. But check out Peace Tech Lab as well. You know, which Lawal mentioned. Our next pod, we're gonna have two podcasts next week. Um, so stay tuned for those and lots of great ones coming up. Um, I mentioned we have a course launching of uh, anyone interested in innovative finance investing for social impact professionals. And we're always open to potential suggestions for guests. We have more potential guests in space. So I think we're booked for season 10, but we're planning season 11 starting in September. And well, thank you so much. And uh, last thank question. You. So which which museum, yeah. you know, I taught in Paris past summer for the second time. What what museum in Paris, or maybe you can't say where, can you say publicly where the where your games will be or you have to wait until it's public? Yeah, I'm gonna wait for for it first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank yeah. you, and thank you everyone for joining us around the world and for the great questions. All uh, right. Thank you so much. Thanks. <laughs> um, so thank. Yeah.